Okay, and welcome again to the November webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. Every month we highlight an activity related to the webinar topic. This month we are looking at an important milestone in the history of telescopes in space. There's a related activity called, Why Does It Look Like the Photos? Useful in a variety of outreach settings. Here's Dave with the details. All right, hi folks. Uh, hello again. Uh, just so you know, this is a pretty quick one. This is one of those, it's a little free form, so you can use as much or as little as you want. And it's great for when you're doing daytime observing, of course, or um, a regular outreach event, or when you're waiting for the sun to go down. It's a little hard to do this at night, but you can find ways to do that too. But, so this activity, there's a, a variety of um, different sorts of activities in this particular kit. This is from the telescopes kit, toolkit in particular and from the why doesn't it look like the photos, which is the question that we all get when we're looking at something, especially more dimmer things like galaxies or nebula. Someone looks through your telescope and it's like, oh. So this kit is, uh, this activity set in particular is, supposed, is designed to help you uh, sort of introduce a kind of a representational color and exposure time to folks. We're not gonna do the exposure time part right now. I'm just gonna quickly do very brief overview of the representational color demo, which of course uses a very cute dog named uh, Rusty. And this is Rusty in the optical uh, bandwidth, um, so to speak, optical light, uh, which is the light we see. Other creatures can see different types of light too, like UV or infrared. Um, if you're that weird shrimp, you see all kinds of light. Uh, mantis shrimp or something like that. My apologies to the shrimp for not remembering its uh, name. However, if you're, say, another creature or a satellite uh, taking photos of stuff for NASA or the Predator, you're going to see Rusty in a different light, say an infrared, and this helps to bring up representational color. So what you're seeing through your telescope is what it looks like. Uh, but the NASA photos often add in a lot of different colors to bring out certain scientific details. Like in this case for Rusty, we want to know what's the hottest part of Rusty, which is the great part about infrared. And so that's why this is scaled the way it is. Rusty, instead of his cute little button eyes, has these fiery yellow eyes indicating that's part of the warmest part of his face, and so on. It gets. And um, you can then go into these uh, maps of the United States, which show, you can start with the satellite image, which you'll see from space. It's in the uh, it's regular optical sort of wavelength. But then uh, say you wanna get some different details that's you know showing a temperature variation, or say you're uh, really into studying uh, radioactivity on the surface of the Earth, you might wanna check out this uh, uh, gamma ray exposures gathered by different detectors, which is a different sort of light uh, and colored representationally to indicate how much or how little that exposure is. And we also include a little game, which I've sort of scattered on my desk and I don't know if we can see, uh, it's not gonna pick it up too well, but we have different cards here. And I'll just do uh, one brief one. Uh, we got, uh, what you can do is you can kind of Put these, say you pick uh, Jupiter, and you put these pictures up uh, just on a table. You can pick multiple objects and kind of scatter them around and have people pick them out. You know, say, oh, is this, uh, what objects do you think are different wavelengths of the same object? Or do you think these are all the same object? You know, what light do you think these might be? Depending on how you want to arrange it. Uh, so then you can kind of, once you look at them and kind of see, oh, I think these might all be related. And then you can flip them around and it'll tell you what kind of light these are all in. Jupiter's interesting because nice and around here and the optical, or visible, it's all optical in a sense, um, visible light. And then you've got the uh, X-ray version where you can see some of the aurora on its uh, poles. And then strikingly, the radio version where you can actually really make out um, some of the real wild stuff happening there and uh, you know why it's one of the brightest radio sources in the sky so anyway it's a brief overview of that it's sort of a fun card game and um, some fun pictures to pass around and just sort of discuss why we put telescopes in space like uh, 
like say the orbiting astronomical observatory mark ii or the hubble or the web and with that uh Brian. all right thanks dave and now for our featured program ginger butcher is an accomplished award-winning science writer and outreach coordinator with over 20 years experience working for nasa headquarters and goddard space flight center She's authored unique educational products for a K-12 audience that are still popular over a decade later, including Echo the Bat, one of my favorite uh, uh, books. She has extensive background translating complex scientific terms for the public and for educators alike. Her undergraduate work was in geography, focusing on remote sensing um, and cartography, and has a master's degree in instructional systems development from the University of Maryland. Ginger's parents met at Goddard, and her father, Jim Kaparian, who we're going to find out a little bit more here soon, started the astronomy program at Goddard in 1959. Please welcome Ginger Butcher. Um, well, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, this is, um, I guess I'm going to pull up my, share my screen. Uh, Yep. Um, I'm going to kind of give a little preface and Brian, thank you for that introduction. Um, cause my background really is more earth science than astronomy. So forgive me if I don't get quite the scientific terms with astronomy, correct. Um, and you'll have to take that into account when, uh, you get to the Q and A part, <laughs> there's not going to be a lot of that. So I've kept this uh, presentation uh, focused a lot on my father and the work that he did um, bringing about basically the uh, OAO program and kind of the birth of that astronomy uh, program. This, um, so um, this is a photo here of my father in a video you'll see later um, that was actually kind of edited down, but the full video is online. Um, Jim comparing my dad is in the middle and there's uh, Arthur Code is on the right. He's from the University of Wisconsin uh, with the uh, telescope. This, uh, no, that was Smithsonian. Uh, Wisconsin had the Wisconsin uh, experiment package. And then the gentleman on the left is uh, Dr. Whipple. And he was from the uh, Smithsonian Astronomical Observatory that had the telescope, which is that catalog that you were shown um, earlier. Um, so here, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, so my story is, um, my parents did meet at Goddard, but my father passed away in 1984 when I was 15. So I don't really know much about what he did and what his work was, but I have these things. Like I have a suitcase and some documents, his slide rule. Um, anyway, so I've been trying to kind of put it, put this together. I've noticed that um, a lot of the history of space telescopes kind of go back to Hubble um, and rockets and Explorer and so forth, and not a whole lot of um, uh, mention of OAO. So um, I'm going to try to bring that about and go through it with some of these um, these uh, items that we have here on the table. So, um, oh, I can't see my notes on the, the bottom. Anyway, um, if I can remember. Um, essentially, uh, astronomers have always wanted to uh, get up above the, Earth, the Earth's atmosphere that's absorbing uh, all of these wavelengths that protect our life on Earth, but is not so good for astronomers who want to learn more about uh, hot stars and UV and X-rays coming from solar flares and all kinds of stuff. So um, I start with this image. I just had this poster uh, scanned and I retouched it and I'm going to ha hang it up in my house because it's 1958 Rand McNally's map of outer space. And I just think it's really cool that 1958 when NASA started and this was kind of the artist's concept of our uh, solar system and the universe around us and it's kind of cool. Um, so I'll begin my story with um, kind of the early uh, IGY uh, back to 1956. Uh, rockets obviously were getting uh, some observations, the Airby rockets and uh, so forth, 
getting observations and getting instruments above the Earth's atmosphere. My father worked at NRL with uh, Dr. Herbert Friedman, and they had an expedition out um, in, uh, off the coast of California, about 400 miles, where they were going to launch a raccoon up uh, into the, um, above the atmosphere and do that during a solar flare to see if they could uh, detect x-rays. So um, this was kind of a pre-IGY type of stuff. They, I, they did go and present this in, in Moscow. But this brings me to my first item, um, the manual of fireworks that was given to my father as a 10th grade prize. So this is how inspiring the young generation um, uh, translates to, to IGY. So in, in uh, Friedman's book, he, um, he talks about how they were out there trying to get these raccoons launched. So uh, they'll go up about 100,000 feet on the balloon, the Deacon rocket, which is a solid fuel rocket because liquid fuel doesn't work that well, launches, radio control launches from the, uh, off of the balloon. And you can do that uh, quickly and catch a solar flare as opposed to having to ready an AeroB rocket and which takes hours and you'll miss it. So that's why they were using these raccoons. But they had a problem with the igniter. So um, Friedman uh, uh, writes in his book that, um, that Jim Kapirian recalled uh, some uh, juvenile experience mi mixing saltpeter and charcoal to make gunpowder in his junior chemistry set. So he volunteered to serve as the pyrotechnics expert on the ship. And uh, with a couple of um, tries, he actually was able to get the Deacon rocket to fire. And they were actually able to collect that data, um, which was basically the first observations of x-rays from a solar flare. Um, so that's kind of, um, cool little story and uh, always get, get your kids chemistry sets. <laughs> um, so my dad went on to do um, other um, high altitude uh, research from rockets and uh, there were two uh, Aerobee rocket uh, launches from White Sands and, um, and uh, they put a, a UV detector on it and they discovered that there were lime and alpha emissions and the night sky coming from celestial objects and not just the sun and not just that uh, air glow of the, um, uh, the UV exciting the hydrogen around the limb of the um, atmosphere. Again, I'm not a, an astronomer, but um, I found this cool picture um, that what we can see now with the um, night sky lit up in UV um, that uh, we weren't able to see back then, but um, he, uh, my dad got credited for discovering that and went on to uh, Moscow and presented in uh, IGY 1958. So here he is. So the reason I brought up NRL and he started there was uh, according to Nancy Roman's kind of recollection of um, uh, NASA history and astronomy that the, the first activities, uh, astronomy activities that were done at NASA were essentially a continuation of that sounding rocket program. A lot of the folks from NRL came over to Goddard when uh, when it was formed uh, about 1959, actually is when they came over. It was uh, Beltsville Space Center at the time. Herbert Friedman stayed at NRL and was continued to do um, a lot of work there. So, um, as part of that IGY year, um, the National Academy of Sciences put out a request for proposals, and they wanted experiments that could be eventually conducted on um, satellites in orbit. Uh, they received four responses, uh, Code and Whipple, Goldberg and Spitzer. Code and Whipple will go on to be on OAO, as well as uh, ex an experiment from Spitzer um, but essentially what they realized was what they were planning, kind of the Explorer type of uh, rockets, they, they were too large for that. So they needed a larger um, platform. So after um, my dad was at uh, NASA, he started working on the uh, first working group uh, in one of, the, one of the first two working groups and um, with uh, Nancy Roman. 
and he wrote the plan for the orbiting astronomical observatories. And that's what kind of revived some of these IGY proposals. Um, so this is one another little um, artifact I have is this onion skin carbon copy with little pencil writing, which basically is the rationale why we want an orbiting astronomical platform. And so from that paper, I'll read a couple of pieces. Um, he, he writes that I've recently noticed an increasing number of artists' conceptions of what would be, have been called science fiction several years ago, but today are recognized as space platforms. Um, these sketches quite frequently include telescope for making astronomical ob observations. Now this uh, obviously is an illustration at OAO. I found it in the archives at National at the, at the headquarters at NASA headquarters, and I just thought it was fabulous. This kind of freewheeling space walk going out, and I don't know what that's like a little TARDIS connected to him or something. Anyway, it's I think it's it's a beautiful um, image. So essentially, he's making the case that you know um, why are we going to spend so much uh, these sums of money to buy that could buy essentially several observatories on Earth on the surface with 20 inch telescopes on mountaintops. And why are we doing just to get one observatory to orbit around the earth? And he goes into talking about the, uh, the answer lies within the sea of air, which blankets the earth bound telescope and the air glow and the atmospheric absorption. And the, the big thing, I guess he's working a lot in UV and, and with x-rays is the, um, the whole spectrum short of about 3,000 angstroms is hidden by ozone, oxygen, and nitrogen. And their, absorb their absorption are denying the observations of fundamental spectral lines, such as elements of hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and nitrogen, as well as emissions from molecular hydrogen. And obviously far down in X-ray and gamma ray regions, there lies the clues to the production and the galactic distribution of cosmic rays. So, um, while he worked with rockets and a lot of folks were, were working with rockets and they were easy to put different experimental um, packages on them and do m multiple versions of them. If you're going to put together a platform like this and send it into orbit, you don't get a lot of chances on that. So there are still um, useful purposes for, for putting on um, um, rockets up like test flights and advancing the uh, development of the instruments will eventually go on satellites. Um, but the rocket results have just uh, whetted the appetite, he says, of astronomers, providing only five minute peaks at the vast store of new information locked in our view of the Earth's surface. And you can imagine sending up a rocket and having an instrument on there and as the rocket's spinning around, it's scanning and mapping the sky and you get it like five minutes. I think it was like out of 15 years, of uh, these rocket launches, they had only like um, three hours of observations. So a satellite observatory orbiting continuously above the atmosphere has excited the imagination of astronomers. And here's the interesting part, that these observatories, um, they all need, they all have different specialized uh, uh, observations, radio, optical, gamma ray, um, specialized telescopes, but they all require similar uh, requirements. They need uh, accurate stabilization with respect to stars. They need a reasonable design platform that they could communicate with and send instructions to and get the data back. And, um, and essentially, you could build that once and swap out the experiments. So that's what they propose. Um, they would put together essentially a platform that the initial idea was that NASA would design the, the uh, platform, all the logistics, the hardware, and that the experimenters funded through um, uh, the National Academy of Sciences and so forth, um, they would have full control of their experiment and experiment would ride on these, these platforms. It was, it was a good a good idea, but they did have a little bit of trouble with uh, having the scientists and the engineers that were kind of keeping them separate. And then the scientists wanted to have a little bit more um, involvement with what was going on with some of the engineering decisions. So that was a lot of uh, kind of management stuff that they had to get, get through. 
Um, I kind of talked about this, but um, here's a, a cool little uh, glass slide I actually had that we scanned that shows um, the LAO with respect to the atmospheric windows. And the quote from John Clark, the director, saying that OAO may prove to be a great step forward in astronomy as the invention of the telescope. End quote there. <laughs> so there was an ambitious start. Um, some of the early documents describe it as that NASA wanted to take a quantum leap rather than a slow development, um, putting this together. So they, uh, from the initial discussions in January and then February, having a meeting in Washington for two days to thrash the whole thing out. They wanted to get all the requirements, all the systems requirements, so they could start putting out a proposal on the street for a, 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 a company to build the, the system. So they had that, um, the proposal to NASA. <laughs> Initially, they were gonna build six observatories at a cost of 57 million, while the first OAO was about 60 million. And then the other ones were like 75 and, and so forth. So um, early on, uh, astronomical observatories were more pricey than most of the other um, spacecraft that NASA has been working on. And I think that's still true today if you think about Hubble. So by April, they had a working group. Uh, then May, they had their first meeting. And then by the next year, they had the RFP for the spacecraft on the street. And I love the schedule. They were like, we're just going to have this like done in two years. We'll, you know, just have the satellite built and launched in two years. <laughs> so um, Groma gets a contract. Uh, here's a model. 23 million just to build the spacecraft. And they were uh, estimating about 32,000 pounds. And uh, they were going to build since they were the same platform essentially and they were going to swap out the experiments they were essentially building the same roughly platform all at once and you'll see later we have a photo of like three of them in the clean room so uh, initially they wanted the launch to be in 1961 when they first started talking about this in 1959 but uh, they scheduled it for 1963 so it was the largest unmanned satellite 44 um, 440,000 working parts, 30 miles of wiring, and um, almost 4,000 pounds. Um, they had some technical problems, uh, one of which was that they were trying to develop um, these uh, TV tubes to be able to measure UV, and obviously glass blocks UV, so it needed to be made out of something like, uh, I think it was quartz, or something lithium. Anyway, um, they still had a lot of trouble putting that together, but they delayed the launch to 1966. So um, we're not celebrating the 50th year um, back in uh, 2016 because it, uh, we launched and um, it basically failed, uh, had a power failure after two days, but what is interesting about um, OAO, and this is a great, another great resource, um, the New Yorker had a talk of the town article and they followed them down to launch and they were talking with them. And the story was, so this was in 1966, April, if folks may recall or whatever, um, no, in November of 1965, there was a big power outage, a, a power grid outage in New York, New York City and Long Island. So as it was, as OAO was undergoing some testing at the Grumman uh, uh, facility, the, they, they just saved it, the wiring from being blown out or affected by this, um, uh, the currents that came from the, this um, blackout. And then in January, it was on its way to the Cape and they were driving the truck down and a wheel fell off of the truck. And so it got to the Cape and there were four attempts to launch. And um, at one point they had to um, uh, sit out a tornado, which I, it said at this time anyway, it was the first one to sit out a tornado on the Cape. I don't know if there's been another one, but um, so it started getting this uh, OAO, it, uh, it started getting a little moniker of on and on, because it was, kept going on and on, but then it launched and they had um, a power failure, so it was on and off, as somebody um, also said. So um, that's kind of what happened to the first one, uh, a lot of money, <laughs> but 
here it is. They were already building the other ones. Um, so they were able to make the case. Uh, there was um, there was still some uh, functions that were working. They were able to note that the, the, the uh, subsystems worked as planned, the stabilization worked as planned. So essentially they were going to, um, as, as OAO2 was fully underway, they were gonna try to fix some of those um, issues, including maybe adding some other capabilities such as a, um, this rate and position sensor and a tape recorder and power status indicators. And they also improved uh, ground operations. They added more ground stations so that there would be less time um, between the, the downlink. Um, and also unique about OAO2 is that there were two instrument packages and they were out shooting on either end of the spacecraft. And essentially what they would do is they would turn it and they would let one package look at the sky for a week and then they would turn it and the other package look at the sky for a week and kind of off and on. Um, here it is in its final checkout at Kennedy, uh, the star tracker, the sunshade. Um, it's interesting, I just watched ISAT 2 launch and it's a laser altimeter. Uh, Earth observing satellite and it also has this cool little sunshade door because they don't want the um, uh, any solar radiation to get in there and burn out their instruments. So OAO2 finally launched uh, December 7, 1968, uh, just about a week after I was born. My dad was at the Cape for pretty much that entire month. I believe the first launch was uh, estimated the middle of November and it got delayed to uh, December. It was a perfect launch, went into orbit and everything turned on great. And whoop. and let's see, what, make sure I have my stuff here. Okay. And uh, so they, there were some technical achievements of, you know, that whole being able to point with accuracy. Um, that's one of the, you know, key things about uh, uh, astro astronomical uh, satellites versus, say, or Earth, observer, or Earth observing. You need to be able to point with extreme position, precision to be able to fixate on a star for an extended period of time and get these long exposures. Um, it lasted well beyond its, uh, its uh, uh, mission lifespan. Uh, the Smithsonian experiment, the one that the catalog is from the Celis uh, scope, I think, um, it stopped working, but it did catalog over 5,000 stars in the UV. And then at that point, the Wisconsin experiment um, just operated full time because they didn't have to swap it back and forth. And um, this is where I'm going to say I don't know a whole lot, <laughs> but um, I do know that there's folks at the Goddard Space Flight Center um, in our communications office that are working on an anniversary article about OAO2 that I'm hoping will go out in December. And they'll have a little bit more about the specific um, uh, science uh, achievements and um, um, the, you know, really where the, the place that the OAO fit in the, the world of science for that matter. Um, but it did provide a map of a, of a large portion of the sky. It did find uh, young hot stars, <laughs> the title of my, um, I think the, some, um, one of the, like a New York Times article had that written in there in search of hot young stars, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, Anyway, um, I have a quick little video that kind of um, will summarize some of this. And let's see if this works. The universe appears to be infinite. But starting from his tiny dot in one corner of the Milky Way, man is beginning his conquest on it. It is beyond the air that we must go if we seek a clearer image of the heavens. Above distortion that makes the stars twinkle, above the bladder of air that absorbs the ultraviolet, the X-rays, the gamma rays, on which much of the study of starlight depends. We need a solid platform, hundreds of miles out in space, from which to make our studies. Not a rocket, not a balloon, but an orbiting astronomical observatory. And that is what has been developed by scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center, where Dr. James Aquarium 
To know the stars, we must capture starlight. Light is cut off forever from human eyes on Earth. For this, we need special telescopes. This satellite, the OAO, is the biggest and most complex unmanned satellite in the NASA program. Built by the Grumman Aircraft Corporation, it is basically a shell into which various kinds of telescopes can be mounted. When it has been placed in an orbit 500 miles beyond the Earth, this space observatory will give us eyes to see into regions until now invisible to man. by a Centaur rocket, the OAO sheds its protective fairings in space. The OAO powers itself through solar paddles, storing electrical energy derived from sunlight. Once in orbit, it relies on solar sensors and star trackers to stabilize itself. Then it opens its eyes to look through a new window in the universe. With each succeeding year, a new OAO will be orbited. The first one in space carries telescope packages in both ends. From a ground control station, men reach into space 500 miles to point the OAO toward any part of the sky they wish to study. Precision is such that the OAO could fix on the eraser of a pencil 100 miles away. Observations can be stored by magnetic memory. And all information flashed to Earth within seconds. Recorded as numerical data, starlight images can be translated into pictures by the trained scientists. The OAO will be another significant advance in astronomy since Galileo aimed the first telescope to prove the Earth was not the center of the universe. So there's actually a longer version of that um, online and they're going to make all of this stuff available on the SVS, um, uh, the NASA Goddard's uh, Science Visualization Studio website. They're going to be collecting a lot of the things that are in this presentation and, and more stuff that I wasn't able to, to fit in. So um, back to my uh, memorabilia. Here's a photo of my mom and my dad and my dad got the uh, Exceptional Scientific Achievement Award. Uh, in the ceremony in 1969. In fact, the entire, you can see OAO is pictured on there, the entire OAO team uh, got an award and a group award. And we also, um, Nancy Roman also got an award at this time. But there was a note from um, at the beginning of this uh, forward for the, this, um, from the NASA administrator, uh, basically uh, marking that the, the, this award ceremony represents a milestone in the continuing effort that has gone into our program to explore space and extend our aeronautical accomplishments since NASA was established a decade ago. The Orbiting Astronomical Observatory spacecraft's stunning success has opened for astronomers a new era of space sciences. With the OAO and others that will follow, we'll gain a new and deeper insight into the universe. We can explore the stars from a new vantage point and remove the blindfold of, of an obscuring atmosphere from our telescopic eyes. And he adds that, I believe Americans now more than ever are interested in the space program and want to see it succeed. And um, we do not intend to rest our laurel, laurels. We continue to go forward as human dedication and willingness permit and this is 1968. There's a lot of other stuff going on. I don't know, like getting ready to land on the moon. Um, so the, a lot of, I think the achievements of this program kind of got overshadowed through Apollo. But for those who are interested in looking um, outward into space, this was really a big um, uh, step forward. And then um, last, this is the uh, last bit of a dedication that um, 
they wrote in uh, Goddard's uh, Research and Technology Annual Report in 1984, when after he passed away, um, basically talking about his uh, contributions to um, this field of science. And from some of the research that I looked at, I thought it was very interesting, his name basically being referenced lots of places, but it's mostly as uh, mentors, acknowledgements, people, you know, he basically helped people work through their ideas. He worked as kind of that liaison between scientists and engineers, uh, kind of working out some of those management things. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't uh, find the quote, but he was quoted as, as basically talking about how difficult having this type of a um, uh, orbiting observatory or, or having a, a satellite or spacecraft to do astronomy because astronomers, as he says, are typically loners. <laughs> they don't work with large groups of people. Like it takes hundreds of people to put together these, um, these satellites and it's not a typical kind of uh, astronomer experience. And uh, it's interesting that both uh, Whipple and uh, Spitzer during the, the initial developments of this program, um, they both, um, either through proposals or private conversations with Nancy Roman and headquarters or something, wanted to, um, wanted to run the program themselves. They wanted to take management of the whole OAO program. But as they were questioned a little bit more by Nancy and others, they wanted to do that because they wanted to ensure that their project or their experiment was going to be um, adequately uh, uh, um, accommodated and didn't care as much about having the other uh, uh, instruments being accommodated. And the whole concept was you make a platform, you put a variety of experiments on it. It's kind of a, um, you can you can swap them out and make this a, a platform for everybody and all different scientists to um, participate. So um, that's the close of um, mine. I think I have one more slide. if anyone was interested because those are kind of interesting. Um, there's the, uh, all the way to the left is the S15. That was the Explorer um, uh, 11, which was the first uh, gamma, um, uh, gamma ray um, satellite. And uh, my dad developed the um, uh, orientation system for it using sensors that look at the sun and then look at the earth and basically able to orient it that way instead of just based on the angle of the sun, that was kind of a new um, thing. So um, with that, I can stop sharing my screen and... Well, that's fantastic. So thank you, Ginger. That's uh, really, a, I never knew about all this stuff. And it's remarkable looking back and, you know, I think that we have kind of this, uh, all of the graphics that you saw and all of the some of the simulations that were in there you know that was state of the art back then and we kind of look at it and think wow look how primitive it was and they didn't know it but they that was cutting edge so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's remarkable how uh, our our i guess our viewpoint changes and and when we look at these historical things that were really remarkable um i know i can relate to this because my father worked on the uh uh, lunar lunar orbiter, and uh, and that returned the first Earthrise photo. Not uh, it really wasn't the Apollo eight one. Uh, there was a first image of Earth from beyond Earth orbit that uh, I had hanging on my wall when I was a kid. So <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. So we we share you know, fathers who did interesting things. So we have a few questions here. And I think that Joe, right off the bat, asked about whether there was an OAO one, and I think you answered that during uh, the course of the. Yeah, that failed. That one was the one that failed. <laughs> so were there other ones after? You know, it's, you said that they had planned for six, and and so it, we kind of mentioned about one and two. They had planned for six initially in their initial thinking this through in 1959 when they actually came about. Uh, awarding the contract and so forth, the plan was for four. And the uh, the one, I think it's the, the, the fourth and final one was named Copernicus, and that one was in 1972, and that one worked, and the one before that, the third one, did not um, work. Okay, great. 
Um, Gary asked if there's any way that you could share that scanned image of uh, the poster, the Rand McNally. I'm not sure oh, if there's any um, copyright issues with that. It's, probably, it's copyright, but I guess friend to friend. Um, um, yeah, we could look into, uh, you know, maybe that's something we could look into, see if they still own the copyright to it, or maybe they don't care. I, I thought it was interesting to look at it, and, and we have the images of series, and if you note know what series looks like in that, and it was kind of our conception of the, how to be this jagged little thing. So. Well, the, uh, there's a whole bottom section that I kind of cut off that had um, paintings of all the different, uh, the surfaces of the different planets, like Venus and um, stuff like that. So it, it is a pretty cool um, image. Yeah. We uh, just kind of an aside, we, we had an opportunity to see a, uh, a there's a documentary on Chesley Bonestell now, which uh, you know, a lot of us that grew up back in the 50s and 60s, that was our vision of uh, what it was like to go to other planets. And so it's, uh, it's not quite what uh, we thought. So. Right. Um, so Cook has a really good question, and there's kind of a, a, Darian has another question. These are kind of related. So Cook asks, uh, and so you might want to you know, think about these together. Cook asked, did OAO2 have an impact on the development of HST? And then Darian said, uh, uh, was the precision stellar pointing system that your dad developed for OAO the same that was used on Hubble? Um. Yes and no. Um, the much of the uh, subsystems work that went into OAO translated to to Hubble. Um, I think they modified and improved the the pointing, um, but I think a lot of the the basic stuff was there. That is something I'm hoping that the um, um, the astrophysics communications folks at Goddard, when they write the um, the article in December, can cover because they've been writing about uh, these observatories for a long time, and they'll have a better idea of like how Hubble runs compared to what we had at, with OAO. All right. Um, so let's see. We answered that one. Um, got that one. So did OAO2, this is from Brett, only see in the ultraviolet? Yes, both of the um, observatories, the Wisconsin package and the, the uh, Smithsonian were um, UV. The, the um, Smithsonian was basically to do a, a, a UV sky survey. It was gonna look at the whole thing, whereas the Wisconsin package was going to lock on to specific um, stars and measure their spectrum. Okay, so that's the book here, that all sky part. So yes, that's, that's it. Okay. Okay. Cool. That makes sense. So um, Jeffrey asks, uh, OAO2 was a great precursor for later space telescopes like Hubble. Did the results from OAO2 and, and its uh, fellows, I guess it's, uh, it's uh, other related ones prompt ground-based telescopes to look at near UV stellar targets that does reach the ground. And that might, you know, maybe that's outside the, the realm of your yeah, astronomy. It, it, that is, I think that um, the, the challenge was, if I can get a little bit of this, maybe, I don't know, the, the, the Lyman Alpha line, as far as I understand, like 2200, angstrom or something is like the most prominent line from the sun so even if you're ground-based and if you can see some of the uv there's the problem that that um uv that's coming from the sun is exciting the hydrogen around the atmosphere so you get if because the, the a lot of the um Astronomy was done with photographic plates and you had to keep them uh exposed for a long time and that glow would fog the plates. So even if you were looking at UV, there were gonna be these Im impacts from the atmosphere. If, uh, even if it's just that you needed to spend a long uh, exposure to get some of these more distant stars. Okay. Don't quote me on that, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's never as simple as what uh, you yeah. think it might be, so. 
Um, so Darian, you had uh, a question here about the photo. Um, he did not take it. He was just involved in the engineering of the uh, lunar orbiter. And in recent years, they did a, they went back and they reprocessed all the images. And I put the link uh, in there, it's moonviews.com. And so they reprocessed all the lunar orbiter imagery. And um, so I guess that comes back that uh, if, uh, if uh, there is no imagery other than the, the UV data for OAO. And so I, I guess we get kind of spoiled. We think that uh, the telescope should be providing some imagery in. Yeah, and, and that certainly is not as sexy as Apollo and all that in later Hubble and stuff. So when I was trying to find some stuff, a lot of it is really spectra, you know, plots, graphs, and a lot of them are like, really um not very clean <laughs> so yeah. um and if i put one in my my talk i wouldn't be able to explain it anyway so i was going to leave that to the communications folks <laughs> so there really isn't anything that that you could even apply representational colors to to make it relatable i i, I suppose one might yeah. say i think i think what they were looking at were spectra they were trying to get you know um that you know across the, the 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 UV spectrum, how much you know the intensity and that type of thing. So you're not getting um, you know kind of these Hubble or even like uh, like the W map images where they you know show you the the cosmic background. Some of it that's as far as I know that does there's nothing like that. Yeah, and William kind of William noted here uh, and he was speculating or wondering whether or not data that's been created as a, as you know digital like that uh is it able to be you know turned into an image or is it just these measurements only in it and if, I, I think i know what the answer is yeah i i don't know because you know i watched that video and they said you know oh they're going to get this data down and then the scientists will be able to turn them into pictures and i haven't seen any pictures in the research that i've been doing so um I think it's really just like that catalog that you guys have. <laughs> David, yeah. if you look at it, it's a lot of numbers. <laughs> it, it, it's a little better than, than reading the, uh, what was that old handbook of chemistry and physics? That, uh, right. There is, looking at that, so. scanning through it real quickly, there is an interesting section when it's looking at a, a little bit of stars here, um, talking specifically about the data processing system. So there is some way to reconstruct these observations, but in a very, um, well, I mean, you can see here, it's like a, to, they take like a comparison with a video camera to this, to that, for these different levels of UV light. So you could do some kind of reconstruction of it, but it wouldn't be like how we get it from uh, stuff now, so to speak. From the very brief second I've, glance through this it looks like it's more of like a they're more like plots they're more yeah. like plots yeah and not super super high res either so you know but you can make like a little highlighter on top of an optical image or something to be like <laughs> oh there's extra uv here <laughs> so it seems like where maybe you could uh, summarize real quickly julia um asked what's the biggest differences between oao and Hubble, and, and I think that we've kind of been circling around that, but maybe you could kind of summarize what the biggest differences are. Well, I think the big difference, Hubble is, um, it's a telescope, like you would have like a, with a mirror and that whole thing, where I think OAO, the, 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 the instruments that they put up there were more like, um, they were like photometers. They were basically uh, just trying to, uh, take these measurements of a star across a particular um, region, but uh, yeah, again, I can't. And I think also Hubble has um, visible, you know, <laughs> and, and a broader broader uh, uh, range uh, along the spectrum. So you're not just looking at UV. So that's a huge difference. Yeah, isn't isn't Hubble a little bit into the near ultraviolet? as well as visible yeah I, it's visible plus i mean visible it's got a little ir it's got a little uv i think i mean yeah i think it's definitely um so you can basically like from earth 
from the earth observation stuff that I know of, it's um, when you take um, a multiple bands and you take those measurements like in, you know, the red, green, and blue, or IR, or whatever, like Landsat, we have 11 bands now. You can put together any three into RGB and your computer and you get an image. Well, Hubble works like that because it gets, it scans in these different um, wavelengths, full images, and then you overlap them and you do composites. So you can get these false color Hubble images where you can get like the visible light Hubble image. Um, the OAO did not work like that primarily, I think, because it was just in the UV and it was yeah. more a spectrometer than a yeah. camera. Yeah. Okay. So we got one more question and we'll uh, call this. We're almost at the top of the hour. And so Brett asks, uh, how long did the OAO2 operate and um, where is it now? Is it still in orbit? Did it, was it deorbited? You know, what happened to it? That's a good question. Uh, it, it, did, it did last till 1972, I believe. So it was a good four years. Um, back then their mission life was like 30 days. I mean, like now our missions are five years typically. That's our mission life. Uh, Landsat just reached its five-year mission life this past February, and now we go into you know continuing. But back then it wasn't that long, um, and uh, and Copernicus, which was the one that launched in '72, lasted for a bit. But I haven't looked too much into that one yet. Okay, well, would be interesting to find out. Do you know whether or not they? Uh, deorbited them and crushed them into the ocean or or did they have the ability to do I that? don't know and I looked up on the NASA website at one point and I looked up OEA and it seemed like there was like a plot like they were tracking it but I I just couldn't imagine that it would still be up there but who knows you know what I'm going to pass those questions along to our uh, folks that are doing the anniversary okay. article and see if they can include some of that kind of the where are they now yeah, that would be interesting to find out. Let let me know, and I'll pass it on to uh, um, to the Night Sky Network membership as as well. We'll add that to uh, the outreach research page. Right. So, okay. Great. Well, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Ginger. This is really fascinating. It's always interesting to look back and see where we came from and how we've made progress over the many many years that we've been exploring. And so, and that's all for tonight. Uh, you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resource section. Each webinar's page also features additional resource activities, resources and activities. We'll post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days, by the end of the week for sure. So thank you very much and uh, stick around for the raffle. I have one extra thing. Um, it is still in orbit. I found a satellite tracker. <laughs> oh, bye. Supposedly it is still in orbit, but you know, that is not confirmed. I would just looked at the internet for two seconds, so. Wow, I wonder, wow. If, I wonder if you can see it because it's big. Yeah, no, it's classified as one of, on this website, it is classified as one of the brighter satellites. It's supposedly really? going right over Chile right now, waving Hello wow. to the observatory. So, so what have... altitude is it at? It must not be low Earth. It must be a little higher. Yeah, I don't, let me see. I just posted the link uh, to the, the first thing that came up that I was looking at. it. So this could all be up in the air, but uh, well. <laughs> no so pun intended. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> dude, I cannot find the altitude at the moment, but yeah, it's got to be higher than a few hundred feet. So my major yeah. access, 7,000 plus miles. Oh, yeah, so it's up there. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that would take quite a bit to get it to deorbit from there on its own. All right, well, thanks for finding that out. We caught that. I, I didn't stop the recording yet. So Perfect. I was hoping to catch it right before. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone.